If some of you don't know me, my name is Andrew Seifker, and I'm a professor at ASU. I teach mathematics, and I feel obligated to dispense right up front a question that I'm often asked, and the answer is no. Numbers is not my favorite book in the Bible. <laughs> if the truth be known, I'm really horrible with numbers, and a lot of you know that. Uh, if I don't have letters, I'm lost. So. That's also an embarrassment, besides the fact that I can't find a button. I have the privilege of bringing the message today, and I'm grateful for that. And what I want to do is summarize what we've seen so far in Acts. We've been studying in Acts, and I get to start us in Acts 17. We're going to do 1 through 15. Uh, then I want to talk about Paul's message, and I want to follow a trail, a line of thought that that came to me as I was reading through this. And then I want to apply Paul's message, hopefully bring it full circle back on itself so that uh, we can see that the application, what application we get from the study. So, now this, this button I can find. So to do a quick review, all right, um, I do this as much for me as, uh, as for anybody else. It just helps me get a larger perspective and also for truth to be calm down a little bit. In chapter 1, we were introduced to Acts. We saw Christ's ascension into heaven, and we saw that Judas was replaced by Matthias. Chapter 2 was the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was given. It was the birth of the church, and we saw Peter address the crowd. Chapters 3 through 6, uh, Peter did miraculous signs, and he and John were dragged before the Sanhedrin. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira dropped dead because they lied to God, lied to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we see the choosing of the first deacons in the very next chapter, chapter 7. We see Stephen. He's uh, being dragged before a crowd. He preaches a sermon in defense of of the gospel, and as a result, he's stoned for it. Chapter 8, the church is scattered because persecution begins. And we also see Philip in the Ethiopian eunuch. Chapter 9 is when Saul is converted to Paul. 10 and 11 is when Peter encounters Cornelius and the, church, the uh, Jews in the church, who made up the church at that time, realized wow, this is not an exclusive club, but the Gentiles are being added too, and they don't have to become Jewish in order to become saved. Chapter 12, we see Peter's escape from prison. The uh, angels, uh, an angel looses his chains, and he um, just walks out. 13 through 14 is Paul's first missionary journey, and we finished that. And we're uh, 15 through 15.1 through uh, 15.35, most of chapter 15 is the Jerusalem Council, where they're trying to figure out what, what's the salvation about, what exactly do we need to do, do you have to become Jewish in order to become saved, do you, uh, do you have to become circumcised, a bunch of issues that they talked about. The second half of 15, all the way through most of 18, is Paul's second missionary journey, and that's where we're at, we're in dead center in the middle of that. Uh, the, the rest of 18 through most of 21 is his third journey, and the rest of it is basically he's going to be dragged off to Rome and executed. So, if I could get the map. We started off in Jerusalem, and we worked our way all the way up to Philippi. That's where the jailer was saved, and we're going to, uh, in these 15 verses, take a journey from here all the way down to Athens, and I believe Lacan will pick up in Athens next week. All right. Okay, so that brings us to the reading today. If you turn in your Bibles to Acts 17, we'll read 1 through 15. <laughs> It goes, when Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Polonia, they came to Thessalonica, 
where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some loungers, uh, just an aside, Loungers there was also a word that uh, they used for basically ambulance chasing lawyers. Uh, they would sit in the marketplace and uh, you could hire them to argue in case you wanted. But other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some loungers, or scoundrels as some uh, translation have it, from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city officials. These men who have created trouble all over the world now have come here. And a lot of translations have these men who have turned the world upside down. That was actually um, a phrase used to describe the Jewish zealots who were trying to free themselves from Rome. They were called men who were trying to turn the world upside down, get rid of Roman rule. And so he, Jason and these other believers were being accused of starting a riot or wanting to start a riot. Um, so there was a riot to prove that they wanted to start a riot, but that's okay. Uh, these men have caused trouble all over the world and have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd of the city officials were thrown into turmoil. When they, then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were a more noble character. Uh, it was a phrase that basically means they were more teachable, open-minded, teachable in their spirit. They were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if, if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did a large number of prominent Greeks, Greek women, and many Greek men. But then the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God in Berea. Some of them went there too, agitating the crowd and stirring them up. The believers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed behind at Berea. And those who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left with instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. All right, now there's a lot that we can, we can get out of these verses, but I really want to just concentrate on two thoughts. One is I want to look at Paul's message to the Thessalonians and to the Bereans. He gave the same message to both. And then I want to follow a line of thought from that message, and that leads to our application of how what Paul was saying might apply to us today. So um, think with me for a moment. Um, what was his message? His message was simply that the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. Well, when you say someone must rise from the dead, what does that imply? That implies that person had to die. I think that's easy enough even, uh, even for a mathematician like me. Um, and I also want to emphasize the fact that he was preaching this to both the Thessalonians and the Bereans. Same message, two different responses. But I want to concentrate on, the, on, on a specific part of the message. I find it peculiar that of all that Paul could have said, he said, the Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. I mean, why didn't he go in and say, look, we're all Jews here or converted Greeks. We're all expecting the Messiah. We're waiting for him. We know he's going to come. Scripture promises that. Hey, I got great news. He has come. Jesus is his name. He did a lot of miracles. We've got a lot of witnesses to it. Put your faith in him. Believe. And I'm out of here. On to the next town. Going to spread the message. But 
Although he may have said a lot of that, what's recorded for us is the fact that Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. Notice also in the message that he doesn't even talk about sin and repentance. Now I'm fairly certain that he talked about sin and repentance, but what's important for us, what was recorded as important for us to get out of it was this idea of suffering. So why was the thrust of his message that the Christ must suffer and rise? Both groups, the, the Jews in Thessalonica and the Jews in Berea, were looking for the Christ. And we've talked about this before. The question is, what type of Christ were they looking for? Exactly who were they looking for? And that's where I want to take us to a couple of scriptures, starting in 2 Samuel 7, 11 and 13. You're welcome to turn there in your Bibles, but I also have it up here on the screen. And actually, John has it up here on the screen. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your father, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house in my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And another passage that we're familiar with is Isaiah 9. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And one more. I think this scripture gets to the crux of the problem. What we've seen so far is that they're looking for a conquering king. They're looking for a conquering king. John 12, 34. So the crowd said to him, him being John the Baptist, we have heard from the law, books of Moses, that the Christ remains forever. So how can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? I think that indicates right there um, a confusion that the disciples had, that the apostles had, the, the Jewish Pharisees, the, the leaders, everybody had. They were confused about the idea that the Christ must be lifted up. They understood that to be yet to be crucified. But they were looking at many more than just those two scriptures that we looked at, saying, wait, the Christ is supposed to reign forever. Well, this was in conflict with Paul's message, because what was Paul's message? The Christ must suffer, implied that he died and be raised from the dead. So I can just imagine that they're sitting there going, Jesus cannot be the Christ, because the scriptures in their mind, don't say that the Christ must suffer and die. He reigns forever. Well, if he reigns forever, why are the Romans still in Palestine? Why isn't Jesus on the throne in Jerusalem? Why isn't the glory of Israel restored? So they're looking at all of this, and um, some of them are converted. They are convinced from the scriptures that what Paul was saying was correct, and others were not. And unfortunately, those were the ones that caused a lot of trouble. The thing to realize, though, is that everything that they were thinking was true. Yes, Jesus is going to come, establish his throne, and he is going to reign forever. Absolutely true. But it's only half the truth, and that's where they got into trouble. Um, they did not understand the scriptures, and it had eternal consequences for them. Not just consequences that day, but eternal consequences. If they persisted in their understanding of the scriptures that Jesus was not the Messiah, then that had eternal consequences for them. Well, I personally don't think that they missed something in the scriptures. I think they simply misunderstood. And that's a danger that we suffer from today. We could possibly misunderstand the scriptures. Let me show you what they misunderstood. I don't know if they ignored it. I don't know if they missed it. 
I think they misunderstood, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll show you why here in just one second. But if we could, uh, if you want to turn to Isaiah 52, I'm gonna, we're going to read something. It's up on the screen from 52 and from 53. We're going to do 13 through 14. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so, so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form mar marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see, what they have not heard, they will understand. In this passage right here, I don't believe the lifted up means um, crucified. I believe the lifted up and highly exalted means become the king. Because uh, the parenthetical statement says his appearance was disfigured. So he's gone through that process and then has been exalted. And this is talking about one person, but it's talking about a person who suffered greatly uh, and then became a king. And then 53, I want to read 7 through 9 and then skip to... Did I really put that? 11, 7. Oh, that's 11. Oh, that's starting at 7. Okay. Isaiah 53, 7 through 9. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor any deceit was found in his mouth, skipping ahead, after the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life. So, whoever that's talking about, and we know it's talking about Jesus, is going to suffer bitterly. He's going to be punished by God for our sins, and then he will be raised from the dead. But Paul knew that the Jews were having problems understanding this. And I think there's a great indication of this if we turn to John 1.25. I also do not have it up on the, on the screen. John 1.25. They questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Now how many people are they talking about? Yeah, it's a good question. It's just the teacher who I'm sorry. How many people are they talking about? Three, right? But how many people should they be talking about? Two. Sorry about that. That was bad timing on my part. Uh, two, Elijah, that was John the Baptist, came in the spirit of Elijah. And then the Messiah and the prophet. Those weren't two separate people. Those were one person. Those were, that was Jesus Christ. But this is where they had, I think, major confusion from their understanding of the scriptures. They were expecting three people. How can you say that Christ must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Because the Christ is supposed to live forever. He's supposed to establish a king for a kingdom forever. So Paul comes in and preaches to them at the point of their need. Their need was they grossly misunderstood what the scriptures were saying. And as a side note, that's, a, that's an encouragement to you and I that when we're witnessing we don't need to have a canned presentation. We should figure out, talk with the person, understand where they're at in their understanding of salvation, and their understanding of 
who Jesus is and start at that point and lead them up through the cross. And that's exactly what Paul did with the Thessalonican Jews and the Bereans. So they misinterpreted the scriptures because they were not humble. They misinterpreted the scriptures because they approached the scriptures in a prideful manner. Now that's a conclusion I draw, but why do I draw that conclusion? There are many reasons, but one of them is given here in our text. It says that they were jealous of Paul, right? Notice that it didn't say that, wow, uh, they were accusing Paul of preaching heresy, and so they were taking out Estonia. Which indicates to me that there was some conviction there that they understood that Paul may be right, but they were jealous, I think, because Paul was winning all the people over. Paul was making inroads and they were losing power. They deliberately continued in their misunderstanding of scriptures. And again, I want to emphasize it has eternal consequences. Not only for them, but if we're misunderstanding the scriptures, that has eternal consequences for us as well. So I've taken this little phrase, that Christ must suffer, and I followed a line of thought. Um, hopefully you followed it with me. And it leads to the fact that, once again, over and over in scriptures, we see that people don't understand the scriptures, don't understand the entire counsel of God for whatever reason. And some of it has some very dire consequences, eternal consequences. And that leads us to our application i got several things I'd like to say. First of all, we really need to examine ourselves. We need to know what we believe. We need to know why we believe it. And um, I think that's very important for us today because I think we're living in a time where persecution of Christians is becoming more and more prevalent. We better know in our heart what's worth dying for, because when we're pressed, we can't go, uh, time out, I need to search the scriptures and figure out whether I need to make this an issue or not. We need to know ahead of time what the truth is and what we're willing to stand for and have that settled, at least as much as is possible. We need to approach the scriptures humbly, not like the Thessalonians. We don't need to be jealous of Billy Graham or anybody else who's got the big stage. We need to approach it humbly with our minds open. We should not make up our minds what the Bible says and then go looking for proof. I've been guilty of that. Oh, this sounds like a great doctrine, a great theology, and I'm sure I can prove it using the Bible. And I, I, I did. I had to kind of turn a blind eye to some of the scriptures. Reminds me of some people that we just read about. But I was able to prove what I was wanting to prove. The problem is, is we'll end up like the Thessalonican Jews who rejected the message. And uh, that makes us wrong. And in some instances, it makes us dead wrong. We should not be overly dependent on the con, on the elders, on a TV pastor, on a godly man, say like Al Mohler or anybody else that you have great respect for. We should hear what they say and learn from them, but we all need to realize at the end of the day when we stand before the, the, the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to hold us individually responsible for what we believe. Will pastors and preachers have to give an accounting? Yeah. But we're not going to get a pass just because Lacan said something wrong or got something misstepped or, or we misunderstood or, or misheard what he said, God's going to hold us personally and individually responsible for what we believe. We should not let culture mold our thinking. Uh, Romans 12, 12, 1 says, um, talks about that uh, we should not be conformed which means molded into the image of this world, but transformed into the image of Christ. 
But here are some examples where this happens. Gay marriage is a hot topic right now. And I am, I want to say appalled, but I guess I'm really disturbed that there are so many Christians that think that gay marriage is okay as long as the two people love each other. The scriptures are clear that God loves the people but does not love the lifestyle. And we have to have the courage of our convictions, know what we believe and know why we believe it in order to stand up for that truth. Because that is a, that's being shoved down our throat right now, believe it or not. And it can have consequences to what we're legally allowed to preach from the pulpit. Whether we'll be hauled off to jail, as some preachers have. Uh, whether we'll be fined or lose our status as a charitable organization and thus have to pay taxes. Those things are in the process right now. We shouldn't let the culture mold our thinking into, well, you know, it's really wise to live together before we get married because that way you get to, you know, learn about each other and figure out whether this is really going to work and maybe you can seal the deal later with marriage. That's not the way God presents it in the Bible. He doesn't present it differently because he likes one wow, I think this will be a real hardship on them. I think I'll, I'll throw this out and see what they do with it. But he does it because ultimately he designed us to have a relationship that starts with marriage. And the love, the sex, if you will, is expressed after marriage. And that's he's designed us so that that's how we grow in intimacy. It's, a, it's interesting. Connie and I have known a lot of people throughout time who have lived together before they got married. And when they got married, we've always, uh, two things have, have, has always happened. One is, is they'll come in and they'll say, wow, I thought I knew everything about this person, but being married is really different, and it's a scary thing. Some of them have lived together for four, five, six years, and they find out that being married is something totally different. And the other thing that we found out or have seen is, is a lot of times those marriages don't last. That's personal experience. I don't know what the statistics are, but that's personal experience. But I got one more. I, I hammer this a lot. Um, if you're tired of hearing of it, um, I'm sorry, but I think it's really important. I need to remind myself of this all the time. Bad doctrine leads to bad results. And I want to give you some examples. We saw how at least the leaders of the Thessalonican Jews knew for a fact Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. I gave you what I thought was their reason. But I want to consider some things that churches, denominations, or, or we in the church oftentimes get confused on. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness, for instance, they believe that only 144,000 people can be saved, but it's a church of a million people or more. Can you imagine living under that, those conditions, under competition with someone next to you in the pew to outwork them in order to be the one who's saved and they go to hell instead of you? Now, because that was such a problem in their church, I think they actually changed that doctrine, but I find it interesting that they can be so adamant about what the doctrine is on one day and then out of convenience change it the next day. There are some in the church that think you have to speak in angelic tongues or else you're not saved. Proof of being saved is you've got to speak, yeah, like that. <laughs> exactly, that's a good example. Some, some honestly believe Pentecostals, when, especially when they first got started, you could see them on the TV. You have to speak in angelic tongues or else you're not saved. Uh, that's a, if we believe that, that's a hard life for the rest of us to live because I don't speak in angelic tongues. Sometimes I don't even speak English well. <laughs> but at least I know it's not well okay. <laughs> It's an inside joke. 
Some in the church think that you must be dunked in water, like we saw today, in order to be saved. Put your faith in Christ, well, that's good, but if you're not dunked in the water, you're not saved. Some in the church think that you can lose your salvation. I've got to confess that um, I used to be in that camp when I first came to the Lord. I earnestly confessed my sins and repented of them and got up from my prayer and went, wow, I don't really feel any different, but I know my best friend, his life got turned upside down. Did I just lose my salvation? Did I not do something right? And every time I sinned, I thought, oh, okay. quick, get down on your knees before you die, or else. That's a miserable way to live, but there are lots of brothers and sisters in, in, the, in Christendom who believe that, that you can lose your salvation. I can just imagine walking down the road. The, the worst part of that is not knowing whether you did something to lose your salvation. You know, did I do something this morning and had a heart attack in the afternoon and didn't get a chance to be on my knees that night in order to confess. It's a miserable way to live. Not understanding the entire Bible as a unit, not understanding the fact that it's inerrant, that it never contradicts itself, can lead to a life of fear and anxiety, and worse, there are people going to hell because of their misunderstanding of the scriptures, the Thessalonican Jews. If, if God didn't work, if the Holy Spirit didn't work on them and they died with that attitude, they've gone to hell. They, had, they heard the message and they had opportunities to respond and they made their choice. But this leads me to, to one more what we in the church oftentimes think. And this is where I think we're very similar to the Jews in the days of, of Jesus and Paul, where we only get it half right. I think there's a lot of us in the church that believe God is love, and he is. I, I agree, God is love. But I think we've forgotten the fact that he's also a vengeful and wrathful God, that he is holy, that he hates disobedience, he hates rebellion, he is going to punish the wicked. He doesn't like living together before marriage. He doesn't tolerate homosexual marriage. He doesn't tolerate us lying, cheating, or stealing. Uh, he's going to punish all of that. I think today we've kind of trivialized the idea of sin, and the church has stopped preaching about it. And I think it has eternal consequences, not only for those of us in the church, but those to whom we're trying to preach the gospel. Let me, let me give an example. I'm very grateful for Bill Bright. He's the founder of Canvas Crusade. I think God has used him and his ministry greatly. A lot of, a lot of uh, college students have become saved because of Canvas Crusade and have uh, grown immensely, but I must confess I have a problem with his four spiritual laws. In particular, I have a problem with God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, but sin has separated us from God. It's all true, that statement is true, but it ignores sin, it ignores the consequences of sin. It ignores hell. I don't think Bill Bright was trying to uh, preach a false gospel. I think he was trying to present the gospel in a way that was palatable to the people of his time. But, to me, when you leave out the consequences of sin, you're basically asking a person to choose between two vacation homes. Hey, God has a wonderful life. In store for you, you can believe in Christ and have this wonderful life, or now you can continue with the life that you have right now. And most of those people don't think it's that bad. They're having a good time. There's no reason to choose, in my opinion, to, to choose between one vacation home and the other. 
And this brings us full circle. This is what I think Paul would be preaching today to meet our need. I think he would be preaching sin, repentance from sin, and sin has its consequences. And I don't think he'd be bashful about it. I don't think he would pull any punches. Because let me remind you of what happens to unsaved people. Revelation 14, 10 through 11. They too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. There will be no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or anyone who receives the mark of the beast. Hey, we're off the hook. Antichrist is in here. There is no beast. There is no mark of the beast. So we're off the hook. Mm, let's read some more. Revelation 20. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet have been thrown, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And we're off the hook again. We're neither the, the devil nor the beast nor the false prophet. But the purpose of these scriptures is to show you that hell is not a pretty place. Hell is a horrible place. It's beyond our imagination. And here's where we get in trouble. Revelation 20:15. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire, along with the devil, along with the false prophet, along with the beast, and they are tormented day and night, forever and ever. No parole, no ease, and I don't think any of us can imagine how horrible that place will be. And here's the, here's the thing about it. People choose to go there. People choose a life that says, I don't want anything to do with God. And that's exactly what hell is. It's a place where nothing of, that, of any of God's qualities are present. God is peace. There's no peace in hell. God is tenderness and mercy. There's none of that in hell. God is love. There's none of that in hell. God is fellowship and intimacy. There's none of that in hell. It is a horrible place, and there are a lot of people who are going to hell, and I think we in the church have to take some responsibility for it, because we're not preaching the full gospel. Bill Bright did a great job meeting the needs of the people at his time, but today people, I'm serious when I say they're just looking at it as a difference between two vacation homes. There is no reason to choose heaven over hell. God has a great plan for your life, but I really enjoy partying. What's the big deal? Okay, I'll go to some place where God's not. The big deal is, is you're choosing to go to a place that is horrific. I wish I could paint a, a better picture than what I have about how bad hell is. And that's the consequence for rejecting Jesus Christ. And that's, that's what I see through this scripture. I see Paul presenting what the people need. I see those people misinterpreting scripture. And I'm not, I hope I'm not arrogant or dumb enough to realize that I could misinterpret scripture too. Now, if we as Christians, do we, if we misinterpret scripture, does that mean hell? No, but it can mean some very terrible consequences here on earth because God is not to be mocked do reap what we sow. He hates sin and he does correct his children. And if you're not saved, then there are eternal consequences for rejecting Jesus. And those eternal consequences, that eternal consequence is a life without God, which is basically what hell is. And it's a horrific place to be. Well, how does a person get saved? Um, a person needs to understand that they are a sinner before God, that they are a rebel, that they are at war with God, that they hate God. This is the unsaved, unregenerated 
the person. And um, they spit in his face. They want nothing to do with him. The Holy Spirit works in a person's heart, and they come to the realization that they are an enemy of God, and there are consequences for it. Now, does that mean that you have to fall on the floor crying when you realize, I'm going to hell, I'm at war with, with a holy God? No. Some people do. Um, I will confess that uh, it was scary enough for me that I cried, but I know of people who don't. But there has to be the realization that you are an enemy of God. And I think there has to be a, uh, a realization that there are consequences for being an enemy of God. Once a person realizes that, well, what do you do? Is there a way I can work my way out of this mess? No. And that's what God did for us. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, came, died on the cross, and in some miraculous way, I haven't figured it out, God took our sins. I was even bored. Contrary to what some of you may believe, I'm not that old. I wasn't even born when Jesus was on the cross, but all my sins, past, present, and future, were laid upon Jesus. And God poured out hell on Jesus. His full wrath, full punishment. Jesus experienced hell, not just for me, but for everybody. So what is that, a billion times over? As bad as it is, he experienced it a billion times over. And then God comes to us and says, look, you are not capable of saving yourself. There's nothing you can do because I am holy and you have a prayer of a chance of being holy. But if you will humble yourself and accept the payment that Jesus made for you, the sin is punished and you can be my child. It's not that God says, it's okay, I'll wink at it and turn a blind eye to your sin. It's the fact that your sin was already punished, and you don't have to be. And that's, that's what salvation is. God gives us His Holy Spirit, makes us children of the Most High God, makes us a part of His family, and we get all the blessings and benefits of what Christ did for us on the cross. And that's why I think um, preaching sin is very important for us today because our society has gotten to a point where they're missing out on understanding the importance, the consequences of not repenting, not changing their minds, not agreeing with God and accepting His, His pain for it, His solution to it. So that's where, that's what I got out of the, uh, out of the scripture. There's a lot more that we could have gotten, a lot of Preachers preach on the Bereans being of noble mind, and I think we ought to be Bereans, every single one of us. I was talking about misinterpreting Scripture and the consequences, The Bereans avoided that by searching the Scriptures. They knew the Scriptures, they were willing to submit to the authority of Scriptures, and they reaped beautiful eternal consequences for it. They became saved. So, that's it. It's amazing how uh, it can take a lot longer when you practice in your office than you can when you stand in front of the people. <laughs> but if you will, would you pray with me, please? Father, my prayer is very simple. I, everyone in the world, needs to be touched by your hand pricked by your Holy Spirit to have our eyes open to the fact that you are a holy God and you have a standard that is so high it's out of sight but you are also a loving God and you have provided a way for us to be with you forever Father open our eyes to what your scriptures say give us a humble heart to learn from your scriptures, to follow your scripture, and uh, give us a heart that cares for people. I'm sure we all have family members that are going to hell. We all know someone who is. Give us a heart like yours, Father. I know you 
you weep and cry and not know when to go to hell. And that's why you're being so patient with this world. And I just ask simply, Father, that you give us the exact same heart and conviction about sin that you have. And that your Holy Spirit will work that in our lives and we will be brave in calling sin, sin, and pointing it out to the world, regardless of their consequences to us. Because as you said, Lord, we should not fear him who can kill the body, and that's the end of it, but fear him who can kill the body and throw body and soul into hell. Father, I know I've been preaching about ugly consequences, and I don't mean to diminish the fact that you are love, but I also don't mean to diminish the fact that you are a righteous and holy God, and there is wrath being stored up. And I just thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our scapegoat, who is the only way that we can be taken out of the world, out of hell, and put a place to heaven. Just ask for your will to be done in our lives, and that our eyes will be open in Christ's own name. Mike Kerrigan was uh, an elderly lady when I first came to San Angelo many years ago, and uh, she was already a homebound lady. Uh, when I go visit her, uh, she was very friendly and always asked about the youth, and always had a nice smile, asking about my family. And she'd always encourage me, she'd pray for the youth, always work with them, because they're the ones who are really leading our, our church. So she had these memories and, and things that she, she, knew, she knew the language of, of church, of Christian language. She knew the, she knew the lingo that, that we use. And went on, and one time she was put in the hospital after I've been here, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years, and, and uh, went to visit her uh, one day. And it had never even occurred to me to ask her about her relationship with the Lord. But she told me, she said, McCon, I have attended Sunday school, I've been to church. I tithe regularly, but I couldn't sleep last night because I really do not know that if I die right now, I would go to heaven. And I was so shocked. I had assumed that the things that she was doing, that she had done, attending church, tithing, Sunday school, she knew the language and all of that, meant that she knew Christ. And when I asked her some questions, I said, so if you die right now, and God the Father asks you, you'll find yourself in the presence of, of God. And he asked you, why should I let you get into my heaven? And she said, I have done all those things, Lacan. I've been, I've tried to be good. And then it hit me. She never knew the Lord Jesus. And I explained to her the good news, Andrew, of what Christ did. But there's nothing that you and I could do. You can't be good enough, you can't be tithe enough, you can't attend church, perfect attendance, you can't do any of that. But it's an understanding that Andrew was talking about, that we are sinners, we were sinners, and we, we, because of the holiness of God, we have, we are rebels, we are, ins uh, we are insurrectionists against the rule of Christ, against the rule of God the Father. And we, we hate, hated Him, and sometimes, there's a form of, I tell you what's more insidious, I think, is there's this, that what Paul calls, there's this form of godliness that somehow we have cloaked ourselves with the religion as man has always done from, from Genesis 11 on. Uh, we, we had this form of religion, but denying the very power that is in it, that's Christ. And when I explained to her the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, like Andrew did this morning, she cried out, just, to the Lord Jesus, she just said, Lord Jesus, save me. Thank you, Lacan, for sharing with me that there's nothing I can do. And it's the same, that's the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are this morning. Maybe you've attended church, but the grounds ministry said that 75% of people in our churches in the United States, the surveys that they've done are not believers. And that has been my, one of my prayers is, God, please, please, we can get so deceived in thinking that we are believers simply because we go to church, we tithe, we attend Sunday school, we do some kind of religious stuff. But let me ask you this, if you die right now, and you're in the presence of God the Father, and God the Father asks you why he should 
let you into his hand. What will you say? What will your response be? What will your response be? If it's anything other than what Andrew explained, that the finished work of Christ on the cross, and then from the testimony of the scriptures, you do, you do not know Christ today. If you're trusting anything, baptism, speaking in tongues, your good works, your religion, you were born Southern Baptist, you, 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 you wear Southern Baptist type clothes, and whatever that may be, whatever it may be other than Christ and His finished work, then you need to get saved. I'm going to dismiss you in a minute, but if you need to talk to one of us here, we'll be here at the front. But I pray that you will not leave this place and, and, until you get it right with the Lord. And those of you who do know Christ, the consequence of knowing, and the text tells us this, Paul reasoned from the scriptures. He didn't simply tell them about what it was that he knew by experience. He knew the scriptures to tell people about what Christ was. So let's, let's be doing that. Let's, let's all stand and let's sing this song to the Lord. If you need to talk to us after the service, come and visit with us.